It is a pleasure to uh, be here this morning, of course. I love chapel. It's uh, obviously one of my favorite times of, day, times of the day. So glad to be um, in this service this morning. I, I want to take a moment as, as we start here and continue our chapel theme for the year uh, on the centrality of the gospel and how it affects our lives. But just, just to say thank you to uh, Clearwater Christian College. Um, as a father of three sons, I am eternally grateful for the investment that this college and its faculty and its staff uh, had in my, in my own sons. My wife and I often talk about this, that one of the great things about our gospel community, uh, and I, even beyond the local church and this being an extension of our local church, is the investment of so many people. Uh, in, in our lives personally, but even in the lives of our children. And as you grow and you get married and you have children, you're going to realize very quickly that um, those children are way more important than you are and you're concerned for who's investing in them, in them and how they're investing in them is a very, very huge thing. And so, you know, I, I just can't um, reiterate the, the joy that it gives me to... Uh, to have seen my boys have the opportunity to come here and God use the faculty. Um, my son still call faculty members here and ask them questions and have relationships with them. Um, and, and so your experience here as a, as a college student is going to go well beyond just education. And the investment of the lives of these people here as they invest in you will go on for eternity. Um, and, and I just want to uh, say I'm so grateful for that. As we continue this thought um, in our chapel about the gospel's impact on our life, I want to talk about a virtue, a grace, an attitude that grows out of the gospel. Sometimes um, it's something that comes from other areas. It's the topic of the virtue of humility. We can be humbled in a lot of different ways. We can be humbled on an athletic field for sure. <laughs> we can be humbled after a test <laughs> when it wasn't, we didn't do quite as well as we thought we were going to do. We can be humbled by circumstances, but at the core of true humility, biblical humility, is the gospel. I ran across this statement as I was reading and studying, and it was the word gospel motivated humility. And that kind of stirred me like, okay, as I look at my life and I'm trying to live in a humble way, where, do, where does that humility come from? What is the motivating factor? What is the humility that God's looking for? And when I ran across that statement, it kind of stirred me. Gospel motivated humility. I wrote this definition of Gospel motivated humility, a virtuous attitude of the heart resulting from the work of the Holy Spirit as it changes us with the truth of the gospel. How does the gospel affect humility? How does that work? I wrote three things down as I meditated on it. I think first the gospel strips us of all our pride and places us as helpless, hopeless, base sinners at the foot of the cross. And when we look at the gospel, we can't really go anywhere but there. And so the impact on my attitude towards life is, should be greatly impacted by the gospel. Second thing I wrote was the gospel takes me to a broken and a crucified Christ. As we, as sinners, helpless and hopeless, look up at the cross, we see a very broken Christ who suffered deeply for us. And I don't know of anything else that should drive us to our knees in humility than to see Christ broken. The third thing, and I love this part, the gospel takes me to an open tomb, a resurrected Christ, my only hope of salvation. 
And that's the beauty of the gospel. It doesn't leave us broken. It gives us hope. And a gospel takes us to that place of humility, leads us to the Christ that we need, and it gives us hope for tomorrow. And a gospel-driven humility takes us those places. One of the real joys of being a coach, i got to tell you, is the relationships you get to build with your athletes. Um, there's just nothing like it. I, I've had the privilege of coaching for a number of years, and, and um, the driving motivation is the opportunity to really work in a deep relationship with, with, um, with athletes and young people. And so, like this year, our women's soccer team, we, our theme for the year, our devotional time, is centered on humility. And I guess that's one of the things that led me to speak on this virtue this morning. But one of the things we do, we're, we're going through this book, Humility, True Greatness, by C.J. Mahaney. If you don't have it or read, never read it, I, I highly encourage it. I, we got one for all the ladies on our soccer team, and we're reading it, and we're talking about it in devos every week. And I'm telling you... I, I love to hear the young ladies speak of how God's working in their heart and motivating them and stirring them. One of the things I asked them to do was uh, write down, this was kind of before we got into the book real deep, I said, all right, ladies, write me your definition or your idea of humility. What is it? And what is, how does it contrast with pride? Here's some of, the, some of the cards. I told them not to write their names on there, and they wouldn't have done it anyway. So um, I told them I might use it, so I warned them. Humility, thinking of others' needs more than your own. Good. Pride, thinking you can run your life greater than God. A feeling you are more important than other people. Pretty good. Humility, not denying the power you have, but admitting and acknowledging that the power comes through you, not from you. Breaking down at the foot of His throne. Pride is a failure to accept and perceive the reality of our utter dependence on God. That's from your peers, not that. I did tell them they could go look around and find definitions if they didn't have one of their own. <laughs> a recognition of self in relation to God, acceptance of one's flaws, and submission to the Lord's way and His divine grace. Pride, the fulfillment from your own achievements or gifts without recognizing it was God who gave them to you. I like that. Humility, putting aside our own importance and needs to meet the needs of others. Pride, taking the glory that belongs to God and keeping it for your own self honor and glory. Humility, doing things for others without expecting anything in return and then this young lady found a definition that I really like. See, from C.S. Lewis. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Good. Definitions and ideas of humility. A couple other authors wrote the following definitions of humility. An attitude wherein we recognize our own insignificance and unworthiness before God. The habitual tendency to think and behave in a manner that appropriately expresses the abasement of self and the glory to God and others. And then C.J. Mahaney wrote this, a virtue, a grace, an attitude rising out of the recognition of your position before God and others. You study humility in the New Testament, Old Testament, the words... Some of them have more to do position with position in life and authority. Some have more to do with position of what you actually physically have, whether you're rich or poor. But at the bottom of every one of these definitions in Greek words is the whole idea of abasement, of lowness. How low can you go? I know sometimes with cars... Some of these guys in years ago see how low they can get the car to the ground and they go over speed bump and the whole car falls apart. They see how low they can get. But the idea there in, in these Greek words is, is total abasement. It is like, how can I, so to speak, be last? 
on the very bottom where nobody will see me or recognize me. And to live that way is anti-everything our culture tells us. Everything tells us go, grow, be recognized. Um, your achievements will bring glory on yourself and everything in our society is opposite of that. This morning I'd like for us to take... We can't go to all the scriptures obviously, but I'd like for us to take the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, just work through kind of the concept of Christ working with His disciples in this whole area of humility and perception of life and as he taught them, look at some of the things he said and how that kind of played out. And just kind of this morning walk away just with an idea of how Christ dealt with his disciples in this area, uh, especially in the book of Mark. So if you would, take your Bibles and turn to Mark 9. Kind of the famous passage on who's going to be the greatest. Mark 9, 33. It's also given to us in Matthew 18 and Luke 9. But let's look at the book of Mark this morning. Just a little bit of background on verse, uh, we, we'll start at verse 33. Here's Christ been traveling on the road, ultimately heading to Jerusalem. This is later on in his life. And um, he's really headed to Jerusalem to, to be finally rejected as the king, to be obviously arrested, being brutalized and crucified. So as he's on his way, he's trying to teach his disciples. And, and um, they kind of, it comes to verse 33. Let's read there. It says, And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silence, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and he called the twelve. And he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last and servant of all. And he took a child and he put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. A couple things interesting I want to make note of. First of all, this wasn't the first time that Jesus pulled his disciples aside and had to instruct them. But it's interesting that the way Jesus addresses his disciples, it, he doesn't... He does not yell at them. He's not um, preach to them in the sense, but he just simply asks a question. And he said, what were you guys talking about? Immediately, nobody wanted to talk. Because they knew that what they were talking about was not something Jesus was going to like. They knew by the character of Christ living and walking with Him that what they were talking about, He was not going to like it. And then Jesus just simply said to them when no one spoke, by the way, He didn't have to ask them that question, did He? He already knew. He was God. He knew what they were thinking about. He knew what they were talking about. And look, Let's get this straight. God sees our heart. And if there's pride in there, no matter how much we try to cover it up or we pretend it's not there, God knows it's there. So he asked his disciples, if, you know, what were you talking about? And he said, who? He said, if you're going to be great, you're going to have to be least servant of all. Again, that word that he uses there for last, least, metaphorically speaks of implying rank, dignity. And he's saying you're supposed to be the last, the lowest, the least important to be the greatest. So he's redefining greatness here for the disciples. Their idea of greatness was following Christ. He was going to be the king. He was going to establish his throne. He was going to be the political leader. They were going with him to Jerusalem to establish the kingdom. And their thoughts was, if I follow Jesus, it's going to get something for me. I don't know about you, but as I look back over my life and I think, how many times have I 
followed Christ with the motivation being, what's in it for me? I go to church so people can see me at church. I go to visitation on Thursday night and go knock on doors and share the gospel so everybody will see me out knocking on doors and they'll say, hey, that guy in the youth group, he's awesome. I work hard and I raise money to go on the mission trip with the youth group so everybody will say, man, look at him. He's striving hard and he goes on the mission trip. Man, what a great Christian young person. I'm following Jesus. with a motivation that what's it going to get for me? And here Christ reveals to the disciples that following me is not going to get you to be the greatest because the greatest is the one that's last and least. And yes, if you want to be the greatest, you do follow me, but you're going to follow me to the cross, to humility. So we find here Jesus teaching. I love the illustration given here in this passage. If you take a little child, put him in your arms, and you serve him, then you're the greatest. Have you ever thought about that? I, I've said this before. I think the greatest people in our local churches are the nursery workers. Hey, right, let's face it. It's... I don't want to be unkind, but it's not the pastor. It's not the guy up there preaching. That's not the greatest guy in your church. It's the lady, and men too, who's back there in the nursery with the two-year-olds, and they're chasing them around. And they're trying to correct them. And they, they spend an hour and a half while the preacher waxes eloquent. Chasing this toddler around, and then when it's all over, the parent comes back and goes, Oh, thank you, thank you. And guys are toddler, and off they go. Does that two year old give anything back to that nursery worker? Nah. If it's a different nursery worker next week, toddler, he really doesn't care. They don't say thank you, they don't bring him gifts, they don't show gratitude. They don't lift up the esteem of the nursery worker. You know what? That nursery worker is just serving God by serving others. Period. Nothing much is coming back. And Christ uses this illustration that if you want to be great, find a child with no expectation of return of glory or recognition or anything and just serve them. Wow, that's kind of tough. <laughs> What's in it for me, God? You know, the whole book of Mark is built on the servanthood of Christ, His example, how He did it. From the very beginning of Mark all the way through, you don't find in the, in the Gospel of Mark, you don't find that whole idea of Christ with His lineage and being the King. and all. It just starts out and it's off and running into what Christ's activities were and how He served people. Jesus, all the way through the book of Mark, He always refers to Himself as the Son of Man. Very seldom is He ever referred to as the Son of God. In fact, the only times really He's referred to as the Son of God is when other people recognizing, recognize it and label Him that. They will go, it was the demons. <laughs> they went, oh, this is the Son of God. Later on, Peter acknowledges this is the Son of God in the book of Mark. And finally, in the end of the book of Mark, the Roman centurion at the cross, he goes, truly, this was the Son of God. But all through the book, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. Jesus even sought in the book of Mark often to say, don't recognize me. Mark Reeves, in his book on the Gospel, Mark said this, Throughout Mark's Gospel, Jesus sought to conceal his true identity. Jesus silenced demonic profession because they knew him. He ordered those who witnessed miracles not to tell anyone what they saw, although silence was only a remote possibility. Even after the climactic profession of faith, when the disciples revealed that they had learned the secret, you are the Messiah, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. So Christ's whole 
example to his disciples is one of humility. Don't be recognized. Like I said, it's very clear that often I think the disciples followed Jesus for where he was going and what they were going to get out of following him. And their pride was just oozing. And Jesus was trying to bring that into check and teach his disciples that it should be a life of humility and that it was going to lead to his arrest. But the disciples probably didn't get it so well. Up until chapter 8, things were going pretty good. Jesus was pretty popular in the eyes of many because of the miracles and the healings and the traveling. His name started spreading. Crowds were coming. The disciples were right there with him. And it was going great. Then chapter 8, verse 31 came. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, and the chief priests and the scribes be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on things of God, but on things of man. So here Peter, he's thinking he's following this Messiah and he's going to be king. And then he starts talking about being killed and being arrested. And he's going, Jesus, stop! And then Jesus looked at Peter and said, Your eyes are on man and not God. A perfect definition of pride. When life is about me and not about God. So he rebuked Peter. Chapter 9, verse 30, Then went Jesus again passing through on Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of man, and they will kill him. And when he was killed, and after three days he will rise, but they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. So the disciples didn't want to talk about this subject. They didn't want to know why. They, their pride. They were too prideful. They were fearful of what it really meant. Then we had this episode in 933 when Jesus confronted them about their idea of greatness and that they must follow him to a different place. They must be a servant of all to have true greatness and be a follower of him. So in chapter 10, verse 32, we find this. And they went on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed and those who followed him were afraid. Taking the twelve again, he began to te teach them saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over, the chief, over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn Him to death and deliver Him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock Him and spit on Him and flog Him and kill Him, and after three days He will rise. Next verse. Now get this. If you can just picture Jesus with His twelve, and He's teaching them this, and look, this is what's going to happen. And what's on the mind of the disciples? Verse 35, next verse. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Jesus, we got a request. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said, Grant us to sit one on the right hand and one on the left hand in your glory. What? Are you kidding me? What are you thinking, disciples? Jesus is sharing his heart. And he's fixing to be arrested, tortured, and killed. And all you can think about is, oh, 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 oh what? God, God, God. When, you, when you set up the kingdom, I want to sit on the right or left. They were thinking about their position, about a place of power, a place of, place of notoriety. And wow. But before we condemn those disciples, how? We're on the other side of the Gospels. Completion, death, burial, resurrection of Christ, His sacrifice for us. We know what He did. How many times do we go to God and it's just all about what can I get from God? Not what can I give. God, how can I serve You how can I serve others because of what you did for me? 
and we just live our life for career, for academics, for money, for prestige, for power, for, for attention, and we just sell our souls to ourselves. We're no different. We're no different than these disciples so often. Look at chapter 14, verse 26. It even gets worse. And when they had sung a hymn, this is after the, past, the uh, Lord's Supper, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same thing. No, God, not me. I'm not going to deny you, said Peter. And all the other disciples said, No, not us. We're not going to deny you. And the pride of their heart was so deceiving, they couldn't see it. And pride is so blinding. It's so deceptive. It takes the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to plow deeply in our heart to reveal how depth how the depth of our own pride. Then the sad part comes in verse chapter 14, 49. Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. This is Christ talking, but the scripture was fulfilled. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And of course they took Jesus and they took him away in the statement in the last part in verse 50. And they all left him and fled. So here are the disciples when they realized that the fact that Jesus, this one they were looking to, to lead them to power and glory and fame, was arrested and taken off as a criminal. Did they help? Did they follow? No. I'm out of here. I'm done. They fled. So very sad. They were concerned only about themselves. They were no longer, there was no longer anything in following Jesus for themselves. I ask you, is our attitude with others and our roommates and our friends and our family, is it the same attitude? If I can't get something from them, they can't benefit me, it won't do something for me, then I'm out of here. Is that our heart and our attitude? I'm going to go to the end because it's time to quit. I'll make a couple comments and I'm going to ask our young ladies, my soccer team, to come up and just sing with us a song that's our theme song for this year. And Drew to lead us all as we kind of go back to the gospel and the cross where our humility is from. But can we take these principles of the gospel and what we learn from our disciples and go back to the cross and be humble? because of who God is and what He did for us. There's ways that we can avoid this, things we can do. God hates pride. I'm gonna, these came from C.J. C. J. Mahaney and I'm going to read them just quickly. And How to weaken pride and cultivate humanity, humility. Number one, reflect on the wonder of the cross. Begin your day acknowledging your dependence on God and your need for Him. Begin each day expressing gratefulness to God. Practice the spiritual disciplines of prayer, Bible study, and worship. Seize your commute time to memorize and meditate on Scripture. At the end of each day, transfer the glory to God. That's an awesome thing to do. As... Drew comes up to lead us in a closing song. And then I'll ask my ladies if you'll come on up and stand here. And they hate me for this. And they've already told me so. But I'm going to make them do it anyway. Gather right here. We have had such a sweet time of fellowship and worship. 
singing this song together, talking about humility I want them to come. As they come, I'm going to read Philippians 2, chapters 1 to 8, and then we're going to sing and we'll close this morning and uh, time of just worship. Philippians 2.8 So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full of accord and one being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in the human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross.